Republican presidential candidates turning up the heat at that second debate, but do they have anything? Did they do anything to stop Donald Trump's momentum? I'm Alex Perche in Washington. Today's big story, the GOP contenders slamming each other as well as Trump, President Biden, and in a showdown in Simi Valley, I'll speak with Republican hopeful Will Hurd for his take on his rival's performances after he failed to make the debate stage. And House Republicans holding their first public hearing in the impeachment inquiry into President Biden, how they made their case today, and how Democrats are firing back. But we begin with our big story. Seven Republican presidential hopefuls taking the stage last night before a national audience for the second time, notably missing from the party. Our party frontrunner, former President Donald Trump, who once again skipped this debate. But joining me now is Republican candidate and former Texas Congressman Will Hurd. Uh, Will, what was your takeaway from last night? Who were the winners and losers? Well, look, there's an there's a impressive group of people on that stage. Um, there's also some snake oil salesmen. Uh, but unfortunately, there was not enough contrast created with the frontrunner, Donald Trump. Um, yes, there was a few more people criticizing Donald Trump, uh, but this should have been a, a complete and total uh, breakdown of, of why you know, Donald Trump should not be the nominee, how if, we, if the GOP elects Donald Trump, that we're giving four years uh, to Joe Biden, and, and that's where the candidate should have focused their fire. Yes, Chris Christie did. Chris Christie uh, does what he always does. But I, I wish um, the other six would have spent more time uh, drawing contrast with the, the person that's, that's leading in the polls. Well, on that note, I, I'm curious, were you surprised that the former president didn't come up more? Uh, look, I, I'm not a political scientist, right? But but I have won some tough elections. You know, nobody thought a black Republican was going to ever win in a 72 percent Latino district in South Texas. Uh, one thing I learned in my time in, in in politics is you don't win by kissing your opponent's butt. And and the fact that that continued and that many people look like they're trying to to you know uh, be you know um, put their resume in for a position in a Trump in a Trump a future Trump administration uh, was. Was a little disappointing. The other thing that was disappointing uh, was some of the, con the, the conversations on issues that independents and conservative Democrats were focused on, specifically health care and on immigration. Um, I, I, the, the, some of those, the, the answers to those questions were, were terrible. And then you saw a continued um, you know, focus on talking about things that sound good, but it's not going to actually solve the problem. And there specifically, I'm talking about some of these plans on how to control the border and deal with this humanitarian crisis that has brought almost 6 million people into our, our country illegally. There was a lot of, of big talk, uh, but not a lot of ideas on how you can address this issue on day one if we have a new president in the White House. Well, and, 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 and Will, one of the things that kind of struck me is, I mean, I'm based in Ohio, right? And so, I mean, a lot of the Republicans that we speak to out there, you know, you ask them issue one and two, it's the economy, and then usually immigration comes up, even in a state like Ohio. But mm -hmm. I'm curious for you, being in a southern border state of Texas, I mean, what do you think should be done regarding the migrant crisis? Well, look, to your point about the economy, one of the things that this was Fox Business, right? I would have thought there'd be, and there was a lot of questions about the economy. But one thing that didn't really get the time and attention that should is new technologies like artificial intelligence. AI is going to upend every industry. It's going to have a significant impact on our economy uh, like we've never seen before. And it was barely touched on. I'm the only person that's actually put an AI plan out there. But for someone who's representing the border, you know, I had more border than any other member of Congress. I've spent more time on the border than all the other candidates combined to include uh, Donald Trump and, 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 excuse me, to include President Biden and Vice President Harris. And it starts with stop treating everybody as an asylum seeker. Asylum is real and it should be allowed, but when you let people abuse the asylum process, people that need asylum get impacted, and that's the draw that's bringing everybody in here illegal, illegally. Why have we seen an increase in the last couple of, of weeks? Because now you get, you're being allowed to have a job uh, when you come into the country um, illegally. That's going to continue to bring folks in. I also think we need to treat human smugglers like the terrorist organizations they are, we which means use all the data that Border Patrol is collecting and make sure our national intelligence
governments and law enforcement agencies are focused on dismantling them and that we work with our allies. We can't invo invade Mexico. Let's be very clear about that. But we can work with our Mexican partners and other countries in, in, in South America uh, to make sure that we're dismantling these, these networks that are making north of $100 billion a year. Uh, that, to give some context to that number, the entire U.S. intelligence budget is $60 billion. And Starbucks and McDonald's, all their sales worldwide, that's half of, of, of $100 million. So, so those are just two things that can be done without, any, without Congress um, having to act. But we also need to make sure we're streamlining legal immigration. I'm not one of these Republicans that's anti-immigration, but let's do it legally. And we should be able to streamline that system. The laws already exist. Hell, I wrote them uh, when I was in Congress that we can be bringing up and voting on um, in order to make sure that we're dealing with this broader national crisis. You talked about the laws that, that you could be bringing up and voting on, but I am curious, I mean, from, from your standpoint, are, like today, are there some common ground measures you think that could have bipartisan support right now? Um, it's going to require a leader to put these things forward, right? Um, uh, there are th those two that I talked about, about the, the dealing with, with, with smugglers, uh, dealing with, with asylum. Uh, there's plenty of, of Democrats and Republicans that agree on this. Um, it would qu require the leaders in the Senate and the House to actually bring this forward so that a majority of, of, of the folks in those bodies would be able to vote on it. And what, what's frustrating about this issue on border security and immigration, this is the one issue when you look at voters. So 70% of Republican primary voters agree with these things that I've been talking about in the plan that I've put forward a couple of weeks ago. And, and Democratic primary voters agree. Uh, but unfortunately, our leaders would rather use this issue as a political bludgeon to beat each other over rather than to solve the problem and go back to the voters and say, hey, we solved the problem. That's one of the reasons that you're seeing this distrust in our institutions is because the public, voters, want to see folks in Washington D.C. and state capitals solving actual problems, not just complaining about them and putting out pithy ads um, talking about what they are going to do. Well, and, and the last thing that I want to talk to you about, Will, I mean, is, listen, debate two already in the books. We've got one ahead in, in Miami. You weren't on the stage last night. Uh, you said your, your campaign has reached an, an inflection point. But I mean, what is, what, what is, what is, what is the path forward here? Well, look, the, the, the path forward is, is simple. The, the message resonates, right? People want someone who's going to solve problems. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm an aggressive moderate, okay? Like, I recognize I've always been a, a, a dark horse candidate. Uh, but folks that, that my message resonates with, uh, they don't always vote in primaries. And, and they don't realize that the, 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 the cake is baked by Halloween. And, and making sure people are starting to engage in this primary process sooner. Only 23% of Americans vote in primaries. And, and so for me, the question is, do I have the resources, do I have the money in order to continue taking this message to the street? Um, I, I ha I've spent the least amount of money um, in this race, and I'm on par with former vice president, with people that have spent $40 uh, million dollars in, in, in these races. And so I'm proud of the organization and the message that we built. Um, but when uh, when we get to a limit where we don't have the resources, it's going to hard. It's going to be hard to, to see this continue. Gotcha. Well, Will Hurd, thank you for your time. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you. Now let's bring in our big story panel. Joining us today, ABC News contributor and Sirius XM radio host Mike Muse, ABC News legal contributor and law professor at the University of Baltimore, Kimberly Whaley, Democratic strategist Rania Batrice, and ABC News contributor, former assistant U.S. attorney, former chairman of the House Homeland Security Committee, John Katko. Uh, Rania, I, I, I want to start with you. What's your reaction to former Congressman Will Hurd? And also, does Donald Trump Trump missing the debate have played any factor or make any difference at this point? Yeah, uh, I, as y'all know, I'm a Texan, uh, so very familiar with Will Hurd and his time in Congress. And uh, I am a lifelong Democrat. I'll just tell on myself right out the gate. But it is one of these situations where I agree with some things that he stands for, like the treatment of our LGBTQ community and the absurdity of the wall. I disagree with him with a lot of, on a lot of topics as well. Um, but the thing that I think 
frustrates as sad or however you want to say it to me is that he is is one of a more reasonable Republican and I feel like we are in a time and place in this country where reasonable Republicans will not be embraced by the base and we're seeing it play out as far as Trump not being at the debate I I mean I think uh, oh go ahead no 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 go ahead oh, so, yeah I, I really feel like um, he the idea that he's just sort of disrupting the apple cart is nothing new. The fact that he's not there is, is not surprising. Um, I did appreciate that a, a couple of folks stepped up and, and spoke a few truths about him. But, you know, the fact of the matter is debates don't really, you don't win or lose on debates. You can make a few movements here and there, very minor, but him not being there is not gonna make or break this race. Gotcha. Uh, Kimberly, look, uh, Governor DeSantis has tried to make this a race between him and Trump and Biden. Uh, there was a moment last night where he clearly tried to make himself seem like the leader on stage. Take a listen here. Donald Trump is missing in action. He should be on this stage tonight. He owes it to you to defend his record where they added $7.8 to the debt. That set the stage for the inflation that we have now. Kimberly, I'm, clear, I'm, I'm curious, I mean, how is this playing out for him? Is he making headway putting himself forward that way? Well, just in terms of the numbers, um, it, it's sort of odd to even be having a conversation about all of these candidates who in various degrees have actual qualifications for president and it doesn't involve 91 felony counts and an attempted unsuccessful insurrection that left the Capitol in shambles and many people dead. Uh, Donald Trump is far and away um, the front runner. And in this moment, I'm not a political analyst, it looks like no one's actually even touching him. And the fact that we've had two Republican debates and they're not naming the elephant in the room, which is that Donald Trump's vision for America if he gets a second term is is very dark it's 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 a it's authoritarianism or some version of it and I'm speaking having talked to experts on this topic um, so in this moment what I would like to see as a constitutional scholar frankly is people like serious GOP candidates coming together and sending a co coherent message to their base um, to Republican voters that the Donald Trump version is the end of of freedoms and democracy as we know it uh, a, you know a weaponized department of Justice. I mean, Joe Biden laid it out today in his speech, and I think he's spot on. John, I want you to hop in here. What's the net net after this performance from your Republican brothers and sister? I mean, where do they go from here until that first caucus and the primaries begin in January? Sure. Well, the net net from this really is that they got to call the herd. They've got to they've got to tighten up this debate, and they've got to get uh, some of the hangers on off the stage like Bergen and I would argue Pence and even uh, Ramaswamy. They're, they're, they're not going anywhere and they're fighting over each other to try and get words in. Uh, I'd like to hear some, a little more serious and intense debate, but one thing I think I'd really like to hear is two things that they haven't mentioned and no one's mentioning, and they're gonna decide this election. One is the polling between Trump and Biden on a, on a head-up basis, they're dead even. But when Biden's polls as bad as they are, and Trump is only even with them is something that should be discussed. And if you look at someone like Nikki Haley, when she's up against Biden, she wins handily. That should be discussed. And another thing that no one has talked about, which is stunning to me, is our leading presidential candidate for the Republican Party has four criminal indictments against him right now. Four. Think about that. And whether you can argue till a day is old, whether it's right or wrong, and the pride of the, of the indictments. But here's a cold hard fact rate smack dab in the middle of the campaign, campaign next year, they are going to be watching Donald Trump in a courtroom in a criminal trial. How was no one well, talking about that? And how was no one talking about that reality? It's like death and taxes. It's coming. There's no doubt about it. And no one's talking about it. That's stunning. And that's something that should be, the voters should be taking into consideration and weighing and deciding what they're going to do. Well, and Mike, I, I, I want you to hop in here. Uh, you, you heard John talk about the need to, to trim here, but... Uh, what do you think the American people gained, if, if anything, last night? 
I don't know if as much as they gained last night, uh, as much as I think that the person I've been watching in the first two debates has always been Governor Nikki Haley. Uh, I thought that she did an incredible job during the first debate, and I thought she helped serve again on the second debate. Uh, Nikki Haley is the only mm -hmm. one who showed somewhat of nuanced positioning on policies. I felt like she was the only one who was willing to answer the questions. And I actually, too, I know I'm the underdog here with this one, but I really actually enjoyed uh, Governor Bergen from Nebraska. Uh, I think that he was refreshing. I think that he was the only one who also, too, talked about policies in a very nuanced way and at depth and perspective. And he also had the data and the receipts to back up everything that he was saying. I think given if he would have had more time to get introduced to the American public and to Republican voters, I think they would see that they he is the business guy that they thought they would have had with President Trump. Um, and so I think with that positioning, going forward, they need to do a two-step in the next debate. One, they need to separate themselves from President Trump and then also to figure out a way that they can be different and or better than President Biden. Mike Muse, Kimberly Whaley, Rania Patrice, John Katko, thank you all. Hi everyone, George Stephanopoulos here. Thanks for checking out the ABC News YouTube channel. If you'd like to get more videos, show highlights and watch live event coverage, click on the right over here to subscribe to our channel and don't forget to download the ABC News app for breaking news alerts. Thanks for watching.